pleasure to welcome you to the first colloquium of the spring quarter. Thanks very much for coming. We have a, an experimental format here, and uh, we are going to have uh, uh, three uh, contributors to a, a discussion of um, uh, e e energy and, and climate and sustainability, and in particular, the focus is going to be on the physics. So there's plenty of discussion, and it's all important and all highly relevant to the politics and the policy and so on. But on this occasion, we're going to try and focus in on some unsolved physics problems. And we've got three wonderful speakers. Um, I'm only going to introduce one of them a little bit, because the first two need no introduction, and we have nothing like enough time to describe Carl uh, um, and uh, Steve Chu's contributions to physics. And, and beyond. Uh, but I will say a couple of words about uh, Steve Coonan, who is um, uh, visiting uh, uh, Stanford from New York University. He's a theoretical nuclear physicist. He's, um, well, uh, he, he was my colleague at Caltech and uh, became the provost there. And I worked very happy for him under that circumstances. And uh, since then, he has had many other positions, including uh, being um, uh, a chief scientist at BP. He's been an undersecretary in the Department of Energy, obviously with Steve Chu. And he's now uh, a professor of uh, civil and urban engineering at New York University. And actually, professor, I think, also of physics and also, I think, in business. And uh, what we're going to do here is have three 15-minute presentations, and then I hope some discussion afterwards, which can turn into a sort of question and answer after the end of the colloquium. So this is meant to be a sort of introduction, an opening up, if you like, of a conversation about uh, physics uh, in, in this terribly important topic. And uh, Steve's um, going to talk about securing the fuel for pr practical fusion plants. Steve Kuhn. Okay, there, there are, this is about trying to make fusion energy practical. Uh, there are two ways to get energy out of nuclei. Uh, just given the general trend of the binding energy as a function of mass, one is you can take large nuclei like uranium, plutonium, thorium, and split them in fission. That's an established technology. 19% of U.S. electricity comes from fission right now. Uh, fusion has been much more elusive. That is the combining of small nuclei uh, to make larger ones. The easiest nuclei to fuse are hydrogen nuclei because the Coulomb repulsion between them is the smallest you can get. Nature gives us three hydrogen isotopes to play with. Ordinary hydrogen, which is just a single proton, 99.98% of the hydrogen that we have uh, access to is that. Deuterium, which has got an extra neutron, or together with the proton, is 0.016% of hydrogen and is relatively easily separated from ordinary hydrogen by fractional distillation, electrolysis, and so on. Third hydrogen isotope is tritium. Uh, its abundance is 10 to the minus 15 relative to the others because it's radioactive. It's got a half-life of, okay, good. Uh, it's got a half-life of 12 point something years. And so the only way it gets made uh, is by, um, um, by radioactive processes, cosmic rays and such on the Earth. Um, if you look at the cross-sections for fusion, which is shown in that figure, let's see if I go around here where the, the alpha particles pretty well stop because they're charged and moving relatively slowly. The neutrons uncharge and just escape from uh, the plasma. There are other losses from the plasma, a uh, lung from the electrons, the hot electrons, particles, heat, uh, all come out, and what you get out in the end, presumably, is some power, uh, hopefully more than you put in. The world has seen, you, you heard Omar Hurricane talk a, a month or two ago in this room about some experiments using inertial fusion, which got a gain of 1.6 in the target, namely 
60% more energy came out than went in. Uh, the magnetic confinement schemes, uh, they're not there yet with the gain, they're the 10th ish, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 gain. But the hope is that once the bigger machines turn on, uh, you'll see a higher gain. That's supposed to get incorporated into a power plant. You take some energy from the grid, you use it to heat compress the fuel, uh, and then uh, ultimately, like most electricity applications, you use it to boil water, make steam, spin a turbine, and produce electricity. One is expecting that gains need to be about 10 to 15 in order to make this work. Again, the NIF results uh, from last December give hope that one may be able to get to enough gain to start to think about something practical. But in fact, that's just the beginning of the story. There are other factors you've got to worry about. Uh, most people have not thought about them, uh, and so I want to describe one of them, which is where are we going to get the tritium from? The half-life is 12.3 years, uh, so we've got to make it in some way. The need is daunted if you just go through simple numbers. <coughs> if you want a gigawatt for a year of thermal energy from D plus T fusion, it turns out you need 56 kilos of tritium. So you're going to burn 56 kilos of tritium every year in a gigawatt-ish power plant, actually 300 megawatts, if you assume the usual one-third conversion of electricity, of heat to electricity. The world inventory of tritium right now, most of it manufactured by Tandu reactors, which are deuterated water that captures neutrons, uh, is 30 kilos in total. So if you want large-scale fusion power with D plus T, you're going to have to make a lot of tritium. Tritium can be bred. We know how to make tritium by shining neutrons on lithium. Lithium has two isotopes, 6 and 7, that are stable. If you shine a neutron on lithium-6, uh, you can um, basically capture the deuteron from it and make tritium, leaving an alpha particle and a little bit of energy. If you shine a fast neutron, 2.5 MeV, on lithium-7, uh, you can basically break it up into a triton and an alpha particle and leave the neutron over. And so the idea will be to take the neutrons from the DT fusion from the plasma itself, <coughs> surround it by a blanket of lithium, and breed the tritium that way. It turns out that the um, lithium-6 reaction has a very large <coughs> thermal neutron cross-section, so you've got to take the 14 MeV neutrons, slow them down, and get captured by the lithium-6. The fast neutron reaction with lithium-7 um, makes tritium and a lower energy neutron, which can go on and create more reactions in the market. On average, you've got to make at least one neutron per DT reaction, otherwise you're going to run out, you're going to run out of fuel. So you've got to make one tritium for each DT reaction. So we talk about the tritium breeding ratio, which is the amount of tritium that gets produced in the breeder, gets bred, divided by the amount of tritium that gets burned. And again, one tritium burn produces one neutron, which you hope will be made another tritium. Otherwise, the reactor is not self-sustaining. The world's got plenty of lithium, and in fact, if you look at the projected demand for lithium due to batteries, in cars, and so on, it overwhelms any demand you would have for breeding blankets. And so there are conceptual schemes by which you take, in this case, a tokamak, a donut-shaped confinement to plasma, and you surround it with this blanket of lithium and something else. We'll talk about it in a minute. If you do inertial, laser beams come in, and there is in the wall a whole lot of lithium uh, and lead, it turns out, uh, to breed the tree. So, there's a tritium economy in a fusion power plant 
as well as an energy economy. What happens is if you've got the plasma over here, you've got to send DT into it, fuel. Uh, most of the fuel will not get burned in a plasma. In a magnetic machine, a few percent get burned. The rest get exhausted. In an inertial machine, about 10% would get burned. And so you've got this exhaust, which has got a lot of tritium <coughs> in it, uh, over here, sorry. It goes to processing. The neutrons are going to come out. They're going to breed more tritium. You're going to add that in, and then recycle again. So this is the scheme. And how much tritium you need to keep in the facility will go down if you can burn more of it up, and or you can process it <coughs> faster. So there's a lot of chemical engineering that has been done both conceptually and at the laboratory scale to learn how to do all of this. The neutronics in the blanket determine this breeding ratio. How effective are you in catching that 14.1 MeV neutron and getting it to interact with the lithium? You can add some converters to the blanket. For example, if you add beryllium, then you can get you can knock a neutron out of the beryllium uh, and turn it into two alpha particles. Uh, a neutron hitting lead with enough energy will knock a neutron out of the lead. So these are ways of multiplying the neutrons in the blanket and you hope that enhancing the breeding effectiveness of the blanket itself. Turns out lead can be alloyed with lithium. It's a pretty good uh, a heat removal. And so, for example, the inertial system, you've got a lithium lead eutectic that's flowing down the walls and is moving the heat as well as breeding the tritium. There have been lots of concepts that have been analyzed. I'm not going to go through them all. Basically, pure lithium metal, not necessarily a good idea from a safety point of view. Lithium lead, as I mentioned, molten salts, and uh, the blankets, as I mentioned, can move the heat. The cross-sections are not trivial when you uh, try to model all of this. Here is the cross-section for the tritium producing reactions. The lithium-6 at a neutron has got a structure to it as a function of the neutron energy. Of course, the lead and the beryllium have thresholds and so require the higher energy. You really want to try to be able to model this before you go out and build a big thing. And so you need to know the cross-sections involved, the angular dependence. For example, here is the elastic scattering of neutrons on lithium-7. The capture cross-sections. Here are the cross-sections for lead, I believe. Lots of structure. You need to follow the neutrons energy group by energy group, angle by angle, and so on in this complicated geometry of the blanket. People use Monte Carlo methods to do that, to understand the thermalization, capture, scattering, and so on. Key questions, and this is, I think, my last slide. Can you have the tritium inventory large enough to do a cold start? So the world has got about 30 kilos right now. That's just enough to get the first fusion reactor started. An eater is going to eat up so to speak, a good fraction of that inventory. So where are we going to get extra tritium? It's got to bootstrap itself. So can we have a tritium inventory large enough so that if the breeder goes down for some reason, that the power plant can still function for a couple days at least? Is the tritium breeding, tritium breeding ratio large enough to start up the next reactor? So you need a tritium breeding ratio bigger than one so that the first fusion reactor can make enough tritium to get the second one started. Right? And here's some uh, calculations. This is a wonderful reference, by the way, if you want to understand all about tritium reading. It's really quite good. Anyway, here is the burn-up fraction. How much of the tritium gets burned in the plasma? You see it's in the percent range. And this is the required tritium breeding ratio. And you see the numbers are like 1.1. Can we do the modeling well enough so that if we go build a big thing, uh, the tritium breeding ratio will be what we think it is? And then, of course, there's a lot of tritium in these facilities. 50 kilos right, gets burned in a year. 
50 kilos, well, tritium is uh, 10 to the fourth curies per gram, and so 50 kilos is mega curies scale, hundreds of mega curies scale. And uh, that's a lot of radioactivity to have around. So I, somehow this is a conservation of difficulty in nuclear energy. Uh, we don't like fission plants because of the waste they produce. It's going to have a lot of radioactivity in the form of a volatile gas. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for an excellent introduction. This is just the sort of talk we were hoping for, and I'm not going to ask for questions now. We're going to defer this to the end, and I'm going to ask Bob Lawson to give the second talk, and he's going to talk about fundamental efficiency limits on the storage of energy. Right. <clears throat> All right, everybody, now for something completely different. Um, Roger asked me to talk uh, about something very Applied, and he actually hinted at this, this uh, topic, and I, what I should have said, Roger, no, I can't do that, because that's not what the problem is. So I have decided to define money as fundamental. <laughs> uh, because uh, what you discover dabbling in energy is that it's about money. Actually, this is something Secretary Chu and I uh, absolutely agree about, is a money problem. And you ask, what are physicists having to do with money? Well, I'll get to that in the end. The basic idea is that physicists are people who can do anything. And one of your skills as a physical scientist is to be able to zoom in on what the real problem is and not waste a lot of time on what the problem isn't. So uh, the uh, storage problem is famous, but let's see. Which button is it? The right one? The right one. Right. Got it. All right. Let's remind everybody what the problem is. This uh, on the top is the famous Keeling curve. This is the CO2 concentration, top of Mount Loa. It's a function of time. You can see the, the annual leaf out of the northern hemisphere and the slow, steady increase over time that is what's alarming everybody. And this thing on the bottom uh, from BP is the cause. The uh, total amount of carbon in this increasing budget, you can do the calculation and add it up. It uh, accounts about twice the amount in the air, it means that the other half is presumably going in the ocean. Now, uh, that's what the problem is, and uh, lots and lots of people want to deal with this problem by means of renewable energy. Unfortunately, the renewable energy is that little sliver there, and the renewable energy is growing more slowly than the growth of everything else. Okay? So, and it's worse than that. The um, about half of that yellow sliver is uh, corn ethanol, which has a fossil fuel budget that makes it a little problematic as far as, as, far as carbon goes. So the growth tells you that, that uh, one could do it, as, uh, but the, uh, the challenge is formidable. Now, let's switch gears and talk about electricity in California. California is a very progressive place. This is a typical... Uh, a demand curve for the California ISO uh, for uh, some day in April 2019. It doesn't really matter. What matters is this giant bulge. That bulge is coming mostly from solar energy in the Mojave Desert, and it's a lot. Midday, it's half, half of the state's uh, uh, energy requirements. At the top, you will see the 2019 battery budget. And you'll see the units on it, uh, that it's going to 100 megawatts for brief amounts of time. So oh, when I made this slide, the batteries were absolutely not capable of handling this, this yellow bulge. And which is to say that the yellow bulge cannot be time shifted. And so you cannot uh, work the system without, uh, without this big bunch of natural gas burning at the, at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, the, the evening hours. Now, it's improved a little. Uh, this is a uh, 2021 picture, and you'll see the battery budget's gone up by a factor of 10. So it's up, it's up to a gigawatt, okay? But it's, and it's uh, not as spiky as it was. But the time scale is still only four hours. And so it's still not capable of handling that big bulge, okay? 
There's this hydro stuff you know, pretty much know about. You can pump water up here. But there's a, there's a problem with that. There's not enough of it. Uh, it's, we'll get to that in a minute. But anyways, that's the situation now. And so this is a problem that is physical. It's an engineering problem lots of people are thinking about. And I am one of the people thinking about it. Okay? Now, uh, here is the problem. And what I want you to, this is a cartoon, but here's the basic idea. We're looking at costs, okay? And I'm, I'm uh, denominating it in costs per watt on this axis, and this is hours of storage this way. This graph obviously has two metrics. One is the intercept of the line at zero hours of storage. This is what I call the cost per engine watt. So when you build a dam in a lake, it's the cost of the dam in general. That's how much it costs even if you're not storing anything. And then the other number is the slope of this line, which is, uh, which is the marginal cost per stored joule. In the case of pumped hydro, that line is really flat because all you're doing is making the lake bigger. And the lake uh, is, is nominally is pretty cheap. Yes. On the other hand, we look at a battery, the green line. And you see that's not the case. Uh, it's growing steeply. Why? Because the way most batteries work, excluding flow batteries, the engine of the battery is the electrode. It's the interface where electron transport becomes ion transport. And you can't buy more storage without buying more engine. And the engine's expensive. So uh, you're, you're kind of stuck with it. You've got a cost problem if you're using modern lithium ion batteries. When you go out to large storage time, you're in trouble. The current crossover point is right there. Okay? That's partly due to a mandate of the state of California, but also partly of the actual physical numbers, how much batteries cost. People can't get the business models to work out here. And they can't with lithium, and they can't get it to work out here for days. So there are there's a physics problem, engineering problem. How do you get your technology to work out here in the sort of half a day region so as to uh, balance the diurnal uh, 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 load? And then, if you're really ambitious, how do you go out to weeks? Okay? You can't do it with batteries. The numbers just, uh, with, at least with, with uh, conventional batteries, because the cost is too great. Now, this red thing uh, is my favorite theory. And you see it's really good. Why is this? Because it's my graph. <laughs> uh, this is a technology that doesn't exist yet, but it's the one that I decided to put my time and effort behind. Why? Well, because as a physicist, I have a lot of background in electric energy. And I kind of understand this engine problem with the electrode. Now, I decided, thinking that through, that it was probably intractable. In other words, it's going to be the case forever that batteries always fail because of their electrodes, uh, because of the atom transport electrodes, and even flow batteries have uh, a problem with that. And therefore, batteries are likely to hit a brick wall when you get out to here that nobody can overcome. So I went a different direction. Now, I'll say uh, truth in advertising, there is a new invention called the uh, zinc air flow battery, which is highly competitive and has a uh, theoretical uh, line here that's really flat. However, it has all sorts of problems and it hasn't been deployed yet. So I like to think that my, my baby is in competition with the, with the zinc air flow battery to see who will win. I think, I think I'll win, but you know, it's, uh, the zinc air flow battery has big tanks of stuff with pH of 2. Uh, not good. All right. So uh, anyway, that's the reason, that's what's going on here in California. And I notice I have Moss Landing here. Here is one of the facilities. Uh, this one's 400 megawatt for four hour duration. It's right over here in Moss Landing. Uh, it got in the news recently because it was a new facility and also it had a big fire. Uh, so California is moving very aggressively <coughs> to build these battery facilities, but they're, they're really struggling to get out of 10 hours. Now, uh, I mentioned that pumped hydro is the benchmark. Not only that, there's a lot of it. Uh, in this country, particularly, it's about 25% of 
of the amount that you would need to level the entire load over 24 hours. Most of it is in the eastern seaboard. Uh, but there are economic reasons why it hasn't grown. Now, one of them, you know, that in the western lands, the water is worth more than the jewels. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you can't cost it that reason. But also, there's a land use problem. And countries that have had a lot of pump hydro are having now big political troubles well, with land use. Uh, so uh, pumped hydro is expensive and complicated and has political problems and government is involved. So you'd like a way not to, not to use it, all right? Now, back in 2011, uh, actually before 2008, actually, I was reading international journals and it came across, came to my attention uh, that the problem had been solved uh, in Spain. And uh, it had been solved in one particular context, which is uh, this little solar plant here. Uh, see those two tanks? <coughs> those two tanks are filled with molten salt. And the way the technology works is the solar field collects the heat during the day, stashes it in sensible heat in the salt, and then transfers the salt back uh, and extracts heat out at night. The reason there are, oops, excuse me, the reason there are two tanks is because you have to do delicate heat exchange uh, and also keep the salt molten. So you, the plants basically look like uh, like uh, uh, oil depot tank farms. So anyway, back then I was thinking to myself, oh my god, this works so well, and it's, and it's a very popular technology. We know the cost, it's being, it's, it's being deployed lots of places in the world now. Too bad it won't work for the wind. And then it hit me, well, it will. Okay? And the key is uh, to realize that in storage, the problem is energy. The problem is absolute energy is conserved. It's entropy management and money. Okay? So it's amount of entropy generation per dollar that's the sense of, the sense of it. And so if you've decided to stash things in heat, you can certainly do it reversibly as long as you watch your entropy budget carefully. So I'll remind you now a uh, uh, simple idea of uh, um, how jet engine works. Um, the, uh, you know, air goes in the compressor of the jet engine and it, uh, uh, there's some fire in there and then it comes out and your airplane flies. I always ask physicists this question, well, what distinguishes the compressor from the turbine? And they never know. So I'll tell you. It's that this end is hotter. Okay. The pressure on both sides of that chamber is the same, but it's hotter at this end than it is at that. And the work is PDV. So it's the DB that's different on the two sides. And so it's entirely due to having a, a temperature difference. Now, um, let, keeping that in mind, let's do a little thought experiment where we take the, exchange the fire, take the fire out and put in its place a counterflow heat exchanger where the working fluid is going through one way and some hot stuff is going through the other way. So they're counterflowing like this. And uh, ask what's the difference between this and the fire. And since you're all good physicists and you know your thermodynamics, as opposed to most engineers who don't, uh, you'll say there's no difference. Okay. As long as you're, if you're watching your entropy budget carefully, there's no difference at all. And uh, that's how you make the entropy under control. You just make the heat exchange be so that the temperature drop uh, across which the, the heat is flowing is very small. So this is a trade-off. You can make that delta T as small as you like by making the machine as big as you like. And so what you have here is a cost trade-off of entropy production versus steel cost. Now, once you got that far, uh, then you can close the loop and uh, add another pair on the cold side, and you have uh, the engine. Now, this kind of engine uh, is, exists in the technology world already. It's called a closed cycle Brayton engine. Uh, these uh, kinds of engine were actually invented in Switzerland in the eve of World War II. Uh, they are implemented modern times in something called the uh, supercritical carbon dioxide engine. It's a really amazing thing 
But to have it work backwards also is the trick. So to make it work backwards, all you do, if you're not making an entry, is run the movie backwards. Okay? So you're running it forward, you're taking heat out of T1 plus here and, and get, extracting energy. If you run the movie backwards, you take energy off the grid, crank it, and pump the heat backwards. And you're doing this pumping on both, on both sides. Now, uh, the uh, efficiency of the, of the uh, heat exchanger I explained to you, the efficiency of the engines, it turns out jet engine technology is amazing. Okay? There's a number of this, the ratio of the entropy, the, the, the uh, energy required to compress uh, that divided into the uh, actual energy. No, the other way around. One the big number at the bottom. If you've got this number less than one that's describing the compression efficiency. In real turbo machinery, that number is astonishingly large. It's in the nines. So it's true that most of most of the entropy gets made uh, in the in the engine, but it's not. It's under control. Okay. The asymptotic limit is somewhere around 70 percent uh, ground truth efficiency. Now. So this is the thing that, that I thought through, and the, the a wonderful thing, I'm a theorist, what can I do as a theorist? Well, make people upset. All I can do, I can't build stuff, and you have to do stuff like this with other people's money. So I, I pushed and I did this and I did that, and now this design is known in the Department of Energy as the standard model. <laughs> when you're joking, see, because it's just like all theorists, you know, in theory, I like to say it, all is dark, all is total darkness, and then you explain it. And then they say, ah, what a great idea. Glad I thought of it. <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, there is uh, stuff I wound up doing, uh, committing various and sundry immoral acts to get the thing made. Now, we're running out of time now, so I can tell people offline about exactly what happened. There were patents, Google got involved, a company in Massachusetts got involved, uh, but uh, the momentum is still there, and one thing led to another, and the patents came through. Now, they came through after my company had failed. Uh, so I am no longer the owner, but uh, what happened was, is the ideas went forward as you want them to, and now a company got created and is now full of alumni from GE who are actually trying to build this thing. Uh, you'll notice I put in red here, I'm the sole author of these, they're the key ones. Uh, how that came about was I wanted, as a physicist, to get something done. You have to get something done, you have to get somebody else's money pointed at the problem. They won't put their money on the line unless they're protected, so this is what you have to do. Uh, the um, original submissions were in 2011. It took that long for the patents to come through. Now, um, well, my banner has disappeared. I'll, I'll tell you what the banner said. I'm finished with the talk. Uh, what does this have to do with physics and fundamental things? What do we do as physicists? Well, what I think is that a physicist is an insufferable know-it-all. And uh, there are times when that's required. And I think this is one of them. What needs to be done to solve this problem is 19th century physics, not 21st century physics. Conservation of energy is the most elementary law of physics there is. And maybe, no, let's say the first and second law of thermodynamics are the, are the big two and they're kind of equal and they're both what the constraints that matter. And the rest of it is very practical things like material science. So who's going to float the idea that the emperor has no clothes and that you have to bite the bullet and actually do this? Well, that's one of the things we fear as are for. Uh, comic relief cause trouble and... Uh, perhaps get, get, something, get something done. So uh, that's what I did. Okay. And so I think that the idea that I planted in your head uh, is that you can be an insufferable know-it-all too. Okay.
Thank you very much, Bob, for motivating very well the question, providing a solution, and then giving us a lot of context about what it takes to, uh, to bring a solution forward. Our third and final uh, cameo will be by Steve Chu, and his, his title is Batteries for EVs and Utility Scale Storage. Two minute review of uh, violent agreement with Bob Laughlin, Energy is about money. And many of you know and have heard that renewable energy is now a cost parity based on levelized cost uh, with fossil fuel energy, for example, this dotted line is natural gas. And so you say, oh, game over. Not quite game over because uh, renewable energy is not reliable. You can't turn it on at will. While I'm here, I, there's one thing that's uh, not plunging down, but actually doubling in cost, and that's hydropower because of the resistance to building new dams, okay. uh, for no other reason. Okay. So, uh, but the full cost of electricity includes all the other stuff you need uh, because the thing is uh, a turn on source. And so these are the things you need. And this is really means that renewable energy has to be, roughly speaking, about twofold less expensive than natural gas. OK, so this is a picture of my favorite battery. Bob Lawson talked about it already. This is how it works. Um, when you have the energy, you do something that uses the energy, which you can put in another form. And pumped storage is about 95% of all electricity storage in the world today, and also about 95% of US energy today. That's the good news. Uh, what about it? If you have an existing dam, it is a lower cost than what Bob's uh, slide is. Bob's dash slide was an ab initio cost. And ab initio cost is more expensive, twofold, or perhaps even more. But if you have an existing dam, it's different. And if you have an existing dam, you have to replace the turbines which you have to do every 30 or 40 years, it gets even lower. So that means building a little pond 10 miles, three or four below the dam can give you not hours, but days of storage. Okay, so because of that, there's been a realization this is the pump storage capacity. It's in, powers, in power and also in energy, gigawatts and gigawatt hours. This is uh, power. And so FERC. Uh, just gave approval for another 1.9 times U.S. capacity. We'll put it over here. What's China's goal? China's goal is kind of out of sight. <laughs> it wants to add 270 gigawatts of power. Okay? Because it's realizing it has a lot of hydro dams already and pump storage will be a big deal. Even Switzerland is making pump storage. It's big investments in pump storage because of that. Okay, so uh, that's where we are now. Uh, but pump storage also requires expanded transmission and distribution systems, and it is not for everyone. It's only where you have uh, hydro sources. Okay, so I'm going to start with chemical batteries and work my way up to utility scale batteries. This is the um, energy density of chemical batteries in energy per weight on the x axis, energy per unit volume on the y axis. That blue dot is the Tesla S1 battery. Where are we going? We're going to about here. <coughs> what time scale are we going to about here? Those batteries are being delivered as samples today. Which means in another five or eight years, they will actually make their way to automobiles. And so we think that the energy density will come down by uh, a factor, increase by a factor two, and the energy cost will come down by roughly a factor. Okay, so how do you get beyond uh, what we know today? One of the things in getting beyond that is you go to an anode with instead of lithium and graphite or lithium, graphite, and silicon, you go to an old metal anode, so it's much higher energy density. There's no overhead in white, and there's a higher uh, potential. And then you go to other materials instead of manganese, nickel, and cobalt, uh, you go to iron phosphate, which the battery manufacturers today are already going to today. The cars being built today no longer have magnets, both cobalt and nickel, because it has already become too expensive. And so you, the ideal thing, so iron phosphate is great, the ideal thing is sulfur, because we're up for our eyeballs in sulfur. Uh, we get sulfur from oil refining, even when we stop 
oil refining, we're still going to be up to our eyeballs in sulfur. And so sulfur also will allow us to have uh, significantly higher energy density. Whereas iron phosphate is lower energy density, this will have higher energy density. So the combination of this will, in principle, increase the energy density and not too much. In principle. Okay, so what are the problems? Well, in this cartoon, you have sulfur <coughs> dissolved uh, with lithium ions uh, in an electrolyte solution, and you need a magic membrane that separates the sulfides, these molecules of sulfur combined with lithium, and so you want to deposit the lithium onto a metal anode. Uh, the SCI layer is the interface between the metal and the electro electrolyte. So the solid uh, electrolyte interface is a sort of a, uh, a chemical reaction that pacifies the surface. Uh, it's a delicate thing. And if it has a little bump on the edge, or in the corner in the middle somewhere, that little bump acts like a lightning rod, a higher electric field means more lithium goes to that little bump, and the bump grows into dendrites. Uh, and also, you need to keep the sulfur molecules from getting and touching that lithium, because it does if it does that, it combines irreversibly with the lithium and uses up all your lithium. So the secret is, can you design a membrane, not as shown in this diagram, but a membrane where it just squishes right next to the metal, so there's no gap between the metal and the membrane, and this membrane allows lithium to pass freely through. It excludes all the electrolyte and the sulfur, and has a high enough Young's modulus, a strength, so those bumps never, uh, never emerge. So that's the idea. Uh, we, I've been climbing the yeast wave for <coughs> nine years in various forms. And in the last couple of years, uh, Young Kai and I have started on something, and he has joined us uh, to uh, do something which is a membrane that looks like it could even work. And so this membrane was inspired by uh, earlier work we did on graphite, graphene. This is, instead of graphene, you have, instead of carbon atoms, you have nitrogen boron. And it turns out, uh, if you radiation damage this hexagonal boron nitride, radiation damage means you take some ions and you dose them. Uh, we found that lithium passes through readily. And uh, you can actually see in the image on the right, uh, under, at the bottom is lithium metal. Uh, where's, where, where's my pointer? Uh, this is this uh, magic membrane, and over here is the SCI layer. So the, and then this is electrode stuff on uh, electrolyte on the, used to be electrolyte on the surface. This is an SEM image. But in any case, uh, what you see is there's, uh, there's no gap between the lithium and uh, layer, and this is uh, has a tensile strength equal to that of uh, diamond, so it's pretty strong. Uh, this was led, this charge has been led for the last three years by Yang Kai uh, Tseng, who is a uh, postdoc of mine, uh, but now a uh, permanent uh, member of the Slack staff. And uh, we tried it, and we found, lo and behold, that we tried at different doses of uh, ions, and we found that if you cycle a half of batteries and you ask the question, how many times can you put lithium on the anode, turn it back on the anode, turn it back until something falls apart, and you see uh, that you can get a thousand times, which is uh, three or four times higher than the previous work. Um, we made a real battery out of this, and uh, the battery just chugs along until this time, about 300 cycles. And, but the failure rate was not the anode. The failure rate was that the electrolyte, uh, the lithium metal, and uh, the sulfur uh, ate up the electrolyte. That was a known problem. And so we're beginning to work on the electrolyte as well. But uh, uh, it seems to work uh, pretty well that way. Uh, in terms of columbic efficiency, now, well, how do you measure coulomb efficiency? The way you measure it is you first deposit lithium onto a metal, and then after you've stabilized things, and then you just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, small cycles, and then finally you go this. This is called the Auerbach method. So it establishes how good it can be. 
And this Kaluma coefficiency is 99.91. Uh, the best previous Kaluma coefficiency was maybe 99. <coughs> doesn't sound like much. But what Kaluma coefficiency do you need? If you think of cycling back and forth, back and forth, you probably need 99.98. So you don't complete the lift and to get a, a thousand cycles or so. So, so we're getting there, uh, which is good. So this is a direct improvement. Uh, we are also trying to use other, these are chemistry, biology methods, not physics methods, uh, but we can actually uh, do this cute thing. This is a fluorescent molecule, and it turns out if the lithium enters into this pocket here, there's an electron transfer that turns this molecule on and it fluoresces. So you can actually see where the lithium ion goes in, in, in operando batteries and in electrolyte solution. So we can borrow some techniques from biology and even single molecule biology to see this happening. Uh, well, I'm missing a slide, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this is been shown, oh no, maybe it does matter, but it doesn't matter. So here's the problem. Full disclosure, uh, the quality of our supplier of uh, commercial, you know, put that money in, you just buy this stuff, and uh, it's changed and the coolant efficiency has declined. We started making our own, and then the precursor declined. And so suddenly these great results, instead of getting better, started to get worse, which means we are now in the business of making hexagonal boron nitride, not preliminary results, and hopefully we can make really good stuff but it remains to be seen. So that's not a typical material science. The only difference is uh, I'm telling you it doesn't work all the time, and most material scientists don't tell you. <laughs> this is a wonderful picture of how you can use this technique of a lithium ion coming in and it fluoresces. This was done where a proton in water actually comes onto a similar dye molecule and it begins to fluoresce. And in this hexagonal boron nitride crystal, those little dots of light are defects and lithium uh, protons rather coming in and hitting the defects back and forth. So we can take motion pictures of this. We can get a sense of what the defects are doing. Okay. Now, the original picture I had was that the ions would come out and would just knock a single atom out of the way and there would be a single atom vacancy that would let lithium ions through. But of course, that's not really what happened. happens. What happens is the electrons of the argon ion fight with the electrons of the boron nitride, and they make much more damage. So what is filtered? And when we look, we can only find defects that have one or two, three or four displacements of atoms. So what's really happening is the lithium ion goes through a hole, and it goes sideways in the between the planes of lithium, of the, between the planes of hexagonal boron nitride, a fraction of a nanometer, gets another hole, goes sideways, gets another hole. So the filter is actually transport sideways, okay? Which is kind of cute. Uh, now, another quick problem. Uh, how long will lithium last? Uh, it's, uh, the price has gone up three or four fold. It's now coming back down. Uh, mentioned before, there's not enough copper and nickel in the world to replace, to be the supplier of future EVs, already these EVs. Uh, there's not that are made, uh, a copper shortage as well. And the solution to that is not find more copper mines. Yes, of course you find more copper mines. The solution is physics. It's the resistance goes as V squared over R. If you double the voltage, you use a quarter of the copper. So EV makers are going from 600 volts to 1,200 volts to make the car lighter and to save money on copper. You want to do this with all internal buildings as well. All the wiring and buildings should go to very high voltage to the last side. Okay, and so there are physics ways of thinking about this that are very helpful, but uh, there's not enough cobalt in the world. Well, what about lithium? Well, it turns out lithium is about as abundant on the Earth's crust as nitrogen. So it's really, uh, how do you get it out economically and without polluting? And so this work began when Chang Lu was a postdoc, uh, co-mentored by Nisui and myself. 
uh, recently because we published a paper, and she showed by working a half a battery, you can actually take seawater that's 20,000 to 1 molar concentration between lithium and sodium, and you can get uh, roughly 50-50, and with salty brine water, which is very abundant, you can get 95%. She's continued to do this more deeply understood to what's going on, and now she's, uh, she says that the recovery ratio is about 10 to the 5, which means you start with this really ridiculous uh, value of seawater ratio, and she can get uh, 7.6 to 1. Okay, so how might this fail? It might fail because the recycling of the lithium in and out of this material might eventually crack, and that's actually what happens. So she's working in our prevent that from happening. Meanwhile, uh, we're trying to do something else, but before I do that, we want to get to utility scale batteries, because this is the real question. Uh, the chemical batteries and lithium ion batteries, there's not enough lithium for utility scale. There's enough uh, lithium for EVs all around the world, but not for utility scale. And so, uh, Bob Loeffler mentioned zinc air, but certainly, get away from lithium, you go to metals like zinc, iron, manganese, it could be air, or you can start with aqueous solution. Uh, and we ask the question, can this magic material, which seems to work with the zinc battery, work for these other things? And the answer is yes, because the ionic radi radius in the water of all these ions is the same. So what happens is you have whatever electrolyte you have, you have the magical air, as the ions go into these holes and go across, they're stripped of the uh, water shell around them, and they're roughly the same uh, concentration, so they too will be filtered out and slip around. So, so that's the hope. Uh, what else can we do? Can this magic material be used to get even better, uh, a more durable lithium ion separation? So imagine seawater is full of this stuff, and you pass it through this membrane, and suppose you get a factor of 5 or 10 increase. It's not perfect. Well, a 5, let's say 10 increase from 20,000 to 1 gives you 2,000 to 1. So what do you do? You pass it through again. You get from 2,000 to 1, you get 20 to 1. You pass it through again, and just like uranium isotope separation, it doesn't have to be 10 to 1. You need to be a few percent. After several layers, you get high purity. The beautiful thing about that is there's no wearing out of the material. And so we're going to be trying this. So uh, I'm going to leave you with that. We have equally exciting ideas exploring how to radically, a radical different approach to CO2 capture and methane capture. And uh, for those in the audience who want to change your career, we have funding. <laughs> and so we will uh, consider especially physicists. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve, for a, 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 another fascinating ins insight onto a di different approach to an equally important problem. This has been great. Um, we're, we're running a bit late, partly because of technical problems. Georgia, should we go, can we go for a little bit longer, do you think? I would think so. Yes. So, so good. So if anybody has to leave, no offense, go. But I'm going to ask Steve and Steve and Bob to come up and we'll, uh, I, I'm going to start by asking them one question and then, then we'll open it up to the audience and then there'll be time afterwards to assemble at the front and ask more questions. So the question I'm going to ask, which Steve sort of started to answer, was if you'd had a second talk to give, what would be the, the physics problem you would include? So why don't Steve Chu answer that one first? Just don't give the whole talk, just say what it is. I don't know, it would probably be uh, looking for a solution to the materials problem uh, for both fission and fusion, but fusion will not work uh, because of the materials problem, the neutron damage problem, the scraper problem. Mm -hmm. And that so far appears to be un not solvable. Okay. Bob, what would you say? Ask him. Ask uh, okay, him. all right. Uh, I still think. So, so I wouldn't work, I would not mention a physics problem, but a physics like approach yep. to yep. an important problem. The reason that the emissions keep going up 
with time, as Bob showed, is because most of the world is energy poor and they need energy and fossil fuels right now are the most reliable and convenient way to get them. What you see when you look at developing countries is a monotonic and almost universal increase in energy with GDP. It turns out it's about six megajoules per dollar. And the physics question is, why is it six megajoules, not 60.6? .6? If you can understand what determines energy use during development, maybe you can modulate it by working on the appropriate technologies. Okay, that's the answer, Bob. How about you? I have to ask, uh, if I ask a second question to ask that was physics related, it would be, um, how do you segue from um, purely technical questions to ones that have a money aspect? Um, and this doesn't sound like a physics question, but I think it is, because uh, for the reasons I said in my talk, that, that what physics is really all about is getting to the bottom of things. Now, uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, has many aspects, actually, uh, GDP per uh, dollar of GDP per joule is a very interesting one. But the, uh, the um, uh, but I think the open question is whether uh, rational thinking about these problems can have any effect on the body politic. Um, now, I, I, he's caught me up uh, off guard on this question. I, I think that's what I suggested is probably a bad a topic for a talk. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, that would be my idea. Yeah, okay. And, well, the empirical evidence is that physicists haven't done too badly on Wall Street. Um, so uh, open it up for questions for our three distinguished speakers. George, yes. Steve Cornyn, sorry, Mr. Yeah. Steve. Yeah. Um, uh, if this, if this uh, reading, reading uh, what's the ratio of power from fusion versus fusion? So you talked about essentially <laughs> doing it in the reactor, fusion reactor itself. But you could imagine an economy where you have both. I mean, we have fusion reactors anyway. And you could optimize those to make tritium like you do in military reactors. But then, and then the two things work together. So, so, so what's yeah. the power? You know, so we do make. Uh, tritium in uh, ordinary fission reactors. The national security apparatus does that because we need tritium for nuclear weapons. A good reactor, uh, well designed, will make a half a kilo of tritium a year. So, no. You need the fast neutrons. Okay. Though, really. More questions? Um. Why are we not losing tritium? Basically, hydrogen is not all gone because it's in water. Uh, what are we alloying or what are we making compounds of, with the tritium so that it doesn't just float away? Well, it's not that it floats away. It disappears because it's radioactive. It emits a beta ray and turns into helium-3 with a lifetime of 12 years, or a half-life of 12 years. Um, tritium will make all the same compounds that ordinary hydrogen does. You can have tritiated water, uh, tritiated biological molecules, and so on. In that sense, it's hardly any different than ordinary hydrogen. OK. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear sort of a resolution between some of the things that Bob said and Steve Chu said, in the sense that Okay, batteries will not work because the slope is too high, yet there's all these new battery designs, etc. And so, can you please can chat I, about Can that? I go first? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're the, you're, you're, you go first. No, it's just that, it's just that, okay, I, I'm champing it a bit on this one. What we see in the markets is that the EV use of batteries is going to dwarf all other uses. And so, when, when people are making investment decisions about various kinds of batteries, they look at the vehicle market only. Everything else is in the noise. Now, you know uh, that the 
electric vehicles have a distance problem. And uh, so that's a research problem. Can you beat lithium uh, to get distance? You'd like to beat lithium in price too, um, but it's already pretty cheap. So the, I, think, I think the problem uh, for new batteries is entirely in transport, and it's in getting the range of the cars bigger. Um, lithium batteries today are about 4% of the cost. Uh, I would agree with Bob that lithium batteries for utility scale can only be a, a small part of the solution, a part of the solution. It can't dominate. I personally think that pumped hydro with existing dams will be the majority of it. Uh, the Bob's wonderful idea is limited by the temperature differences you can work in the and, and the temperatures of the steel. If you can raise those temperatures by a few hundred Kelvin, his definitely becomes good. But now, so I looked at the batteries and said, can you change the boundary conditions Batteries are becoming twofold cheaper, probably from that graph being made. Can you make them three or fourfold cheaper? That just lowers that slope by twofold, fourfold. Okay. At that point, it's anyone's game. And then it becomes a materials uh, problem, and that's why I started working on materials. <laughs> because you want the materials to be so abundant, so cheap, uh, that it never becomes a rate limiting stuff. It remains at a few percent of the total cost. Can I weigh in yes, uh, just on, on batteries for grid scale storage? Mm -hmm. I, you know, the idea is not necessarily to have storage to back up the renewables, but some dispatchable energy source. And for me, Iconic is a set of papers that my colleague, my friend Nate Lewis at Caltech and Ken Caldera here did, where they took real wind and solar statistics over 40 years and asked what's the right mix of nuclear batteries, um, uh, gas with CCS, and the batteries surprisingly come out to play not very much of a role when you try to optimize cost and meet all the demand. Can I also weigh in a little bit, you know, we haven't talked about fission, and the rejection of fission because of the waste issues, uh, because of the possible contamination issues, this is technology we know better than fusion by a long shot. We can make reactors that are essentially going to be non-contamination proof. Uh, we, I think we can cure the storage problem by having automated boring uh, so that you can go a half a kilometer deep and sideways so you don't really, it's like the difference in cost between uh, human space missions and non-human <coughs> space missions. It's going to be huge. And then finally, the CapEx problem. You got to use this thing 100% of the time. But we're looking for storage that works 5 or 10 percent of the time. So we have what's called an energy market, where natural gas generators are only used 5 percent of the time, but they're profitable because they get to charge 100 times more uh, for the energy. Because you're in a time when you really need the energy, and you get to charge what physicists call the short hair price. When they got you by the short hairs, you'll pay anything. And so what happens is you can use nuclear to desalinate or to make hydrogen, which we didn't talk about, which is also going to be part of the solution. And the rest of the time, you know, the 5% of the time, you supply, you know, the emergency power. And so this is a, this could change the dynamics of nuclear if you can build them at the cost of pre three mile island costs. $8 a watt. <laughs> Okay. Say that again. Say $8 a watt. $8 so, a watt. So, okay. Capital. So I, get Capital. To before, before I get to weigh in, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's well known in nuclear physics, one of the, one of the nuclear engineering in the, in the uh, that um, all the energy comes from fission. And that's the reality that you have always when you're doing nuclear engineering. That the, the fusion reaction is 17 MeV. The, the fission reaction is 230 and it's much easier to control. So when you're counting joules, fission wins by miles. And that's, all, that's going to be true forever. Now, uh, it's a, Steve is completely correct. It's a terrific technology. There is a uranium supply problem if you try to up the amount of, uh, of, new, of fission energy to supply the world budget. Um, 
There's, uh, there are technologies in the wings for supplying uh, kilograms of, you know, the requisite kilograms of uranium at cost. Uh, but at present market prices, uh, you couldn't do it. But the good news is that the fuel in a nuclear reactor is a small fraction of the total cost. Yeah. Right. So if the fuel doubled in price, uh, not this is all true. Impact. It's all true. But of course, if there's not enough fuel, what's the price going to be? Well, and and, <laughs> and we only use one percent of the energy content. If you include yeah. the U yeah. two thirty eight, uh, it's going to go to two percent. And uh, two years before the lithium paper was published, we published a paper on how to get uranium out of seawater. Seawater. Yeah. Uh, that there's enough uranium yeah. in seawater yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but it's not considered important until the nuclear industry starts. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. I thought. Let's have another question. Thorium too, I think. But, uh, yeah. So, the, uh, before I came here today, I would have thought that if it were not for social factors to do with fission, that fission would nuclear fission would sort of win this. And be the way to go. Could you, could you comment on that? I, I think that's kind of what you heard in the last yeah, minute or two. It's the capex yeah. costs have, yeah. have gone up eightfold. Yeah. Okay, and that's the killer. Uh, you've got to get them back down, and then and then having and they can be actually, uh, you know, five percent suppliers of electricity. And the rest of the time, you make other things like hydrogen, uh, which will have a big market as well. So so. So so I think possible. we we all see this the same way, uh, knowing physics now. The lay of the land uh, right now is that uh, phys fission has an enormous political problem all over the world. It was born public. So the other kinds of uh, energy sources are all inherently private, but because of the war, because of how nuclear energy came to be, it has a public component, and the public has a big say in whether you're going to have it and how much you're going to have. And, uh, Absent a generational sea change, I think we're not going to have it for a while. So, I, just one higher level comment. Bob's right, I think. Um, when you listen to what Steve was just saying, uh, it's a systems problem. There is no single bullet. And you've got to look at the interactions among the transportation, the renewables, the storage, and optimize the whole thing. Actually, waste storage is a really important thing because in the United States, there's resistance to even shipping spent fuel across state lines. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and, and so just getting over that hurdle means that you want to actually look for new methods locally with deep boring methods mm -hmm. locally. Otherwise, you've still got a problem. Yeah. Other countries may respond differently. Giorgio, I think you had a question. Yeah, because I mean, this is actually, I mean, this is a maddening issue, right, of, of, of fusion energy, or, uh, and, and it seems to me like we should just be investing 10% of the R&D money that goes into, to, into PR, or social engineering, or whatever you want to call it. It's the same problem with vaccines, right? I mean, we are so good at doing the technology, you know, the biology of the vaccines, and then we just forgot, or we were not very clever at actually explaining or making sure people would actually get get shots in a timely fashion. And I think the nuclear energy is, is a very, very similar. Uh, you know, the fusion, fusion energy is a very, very similar problem. You know, people don't accept it for irrational reasons. And slowly, slowly. You know, Europe just in the last few months declared fission was acceptably green. And it's I, true, yeah. the Green Party in Germany decided that <laughs> yeah. yeah. nuclear energy yeah. was green. Yeah. So let, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Governor Newsom ran, ran on the, that he was going to shut down the last two nuclear reactors, the Avo Canyon. There's a couple of us, Steve and I included, that engaged and he convinced, and he's turned completely around and now he's supporting the Avo Canyon, not to keep it open for a few years, but to get a 20-year licensee. I gave a talk last year in Germany, in Berlin, where a bunch of ministers were hanging out, and I said, look, consider what you want. You're against high-voltage transmission lines, you're against nuclear. All your energy, your solar sucks. <laughs> you more polite for words than that. But all your real energy is in the North Sea and, the, and off the coast of Germany, and so, what are you going to do when all your wealth creation is in heavy plastics, heavily energy intensive steel, and automobiles? 
And so you have nuclear. Don't shut down your last couple of power plants. And they have it. They've paused now. Yeah. So and so it might turn around. Reality sits yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yes, except let me just say, you know, until there is another, the next taxi. Yeah. But and, and the problem is that we tell people, oh, this is, this is safe, don't worry about it. And people interpret this as, this is infinitely safe, which of course <laughs> doesn't exist. And then something happens as, oh, see, you lie. And then... Well, you have to, it, look, it's, just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a significant thing every 20 years. You want to make it every 100 years. Uh, and that's going to be good enough. But, but, but the, there are new designs. I mean, when I was secretary, I said, we only support designs that are, will never contaminate. That, they had enough heat capacity. If you lost control of, of your electricity, your water supply, everything, there's enough heat capacity that it doesn't melt down. It's possible to make reactors like that. Anyone else? Question on that? So, uh, so you talked about uh, energy production and storage. So I'm curious about energy transport. Are there any new innovations that would need to be made to transport the energy or just more of what we already have? <laughs> Let me take that. Go ahead. Okay. This is a physics problem, man. <laughs> Calculate the capacity in watts of an oil pipeline that's a meter in diameter compared to solve Maxwell's equations for a 1,000 kilovolt transmission line. Okay? And you'll find they're not even in the same ballpark. Okay? The only efficient way to get stupendous number of watts from here to there through, is through physical medium and pipelines. There's a, there's a limit that comes from breakdown voltages of transmission lines. It's about two gigawatts uh, or a big powerful line. And that's just not enough, okay? A, a big metro area is 15. Uh, so no, uh, for long haul transmission, there is no substitute for pipelines. It's because chemical energy has so much higher energy density. Uh, the, China has two and three gigawatts per two pair of wires. It can go three, 400 miles, but it costs uh, a couple of billion dollars per mile. So to put it in everyday terms, when you fill up uh, your car with petrol, you're wielding about 10 megawatts, okay, 120 megajoules per gallon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we don't charge electric vehicles at 10 megawatts. Okay, so, and then the hope of having a hydrogen pipeline instead of natural gas pipelines is the fact that we found out, well, hydrogen is very, very leaky, number one. Number two, the only way we can detect hydrogen is through mass spectrometry which means it's expensive and it can't be remote for sure. Uh, and number three, so, you, and so hydrogen in the atmosphere, carbon. if there are pipelines, will leak enough at the one or two percent <laughs> that it keeps methane uh, in the upper atmosphere alive for a factors of two or three longer, which is, means it's effectively a potent greenhouse gas. So hydrogen also has problems. Okay. It also, it also <laughs> can't be sent through the... Yeah. The present day yeah, pipeline. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. new pipelines, yeah, yeah. you can't yeah, yeah. Yeah. leak detect. Try so that that who's going to build the new yeah, pipeline? Yes, right. Who's they right. They, they, word, they, but they, somebody they have, the, have the last question. <laughs> so you talked about the pump storage as being like a thing that's growing a lot, but it, it's so difficult to move energy from where you're making it to where you're pumping the water. Like, what's overcoming that? So you can't have a solar field, I would assume, in the same place that you're pumping a bunch of water. As I said in my talk, transmission distribution is, needs to be part of the solution of pump storage. Absolutely. And so that's why people are looking seriously at hydrogen, despite its flaws. Yeah. Okay? Okay, well, look, let's Good. thank Steve. Good. Thank you. We'll repair some of these physics. Uh, there's a physical yeah. refresher. It was That's good. Good, Steve. It was great. Good discussion. It was good. Yeah. I think people learn stuff. <laughs>